<laughs> All right, we are here with. Go ahead. I don't want to say your name wrong. Yeah, it's just in Mitri, so not that complicated. No, not too complicated. Um, and you used to work directly for Zabbix. Is that correct? That's absolutely true. I've worked for the Zabbix company, uh, well, basically two and a half years. Okay. So. so you have a lot of direct insight into uh, everything about how Zabbix works, not just from a external user side, but from a developer side as well. That's true. Like uh, when I started to work in Zabbix two and a half years ago, I didn't have any experience with it. I basically, before I started to work, I just Googled what Zabbix is. And then I found out that, hey, this is a monitoring tool, open source tool. So, okay. And uh, for the two and a half years in the company, it's like really a lot of experience, not only just uh, technical stuff, but uh, also a lot of tra travels, a lot of use cases all around the world, world different companies and, and stuff like that. I use Zabbix myself, and I guess we should probably have started with this, but let's talk about what Zabbix is. Uh, it's a monitoring tool would be the short description, but give me a little bit more depth on description of, uh, well, the sales and marketing pitch they give for it. Well, the monitoring tool, yes, indeed, it is like pretty simple explanation what it is, but what I find uh, very good inside of Zabbix and why personally I choose the Zabbix for my own is... Uh, First of all, it's open source, so it's absolutely free. You don't have to pay any money to use the Zabbix. And the most frequent question is like, yeah, right, like where's the catch? So we get a demo version for free, and how much do we need to pay for full functionality? None. It's all, all absolutely free. All the functionality Zabbix currently has is available for free. You can go download, install, and start using it. Uh, then the flexibility. I had a chance to try and, and do a research on multiple monitoring softwares. I won't call the names, like the top five of currently available. And they're pretty friendly for the users. And I would say that uh, the most important thing there is that there's a lot of things available from the box. Like let's say you want to monitor um, I don't know, network or, or some cloud environments, Azure, AWS, something like that. Yeah, you just go in the front end, click add new, new, add some fields and you're done. In the Zabbix, it's more about customization. So you, there will be a lot of things available from the box, like the same as NMP stuff and, and also the VMware. But if you have something like really specific and you need a way how to monitor that, you can customize the Zabbix. You can write your own scripts and any programming languages you know, there's no restrictions. You can use Bash, C, C++, Python, whatever else, and, and even PowerShell on Windows and just integrate it with a Zabbix. So there's a lot of use cases from not a standard point of view, what you can monitor, what people are doing. And yeah, I guess we can talk about it a bit later. Well, in... I, what turned me on is Zabbix, the same thing you said, it's open source, and I should mention it's cross-platform. So you can actually use this to monitor your Windows servers and your application servers. So I'm using it, uh, I don't, everything I do is pretty straightforward and standard. So um, all the monitoring I'm doing with Zabbix for our own infrastructure, um, it, the basic out-of-the-box scripts work perfectly fine. I needed to monitor my web servers, uh, make sure they're all up and running. I needed to monitor a couple little applications like SQL, works fine for that. And I have it monitoring my free NAS storage servers and it keeps an eye on those and lets me know if they're under too much load or anything like that. So I found the the basics of Zabbix really simple to get going on. Um, and it, you know, then you can do that deeper dive later. And that's actually why I used to have a YouTube channel. Um, and part of the reason we're talking about this, because you have a channel where you take a lot of those deeper dives into the API, into the customization of Zabbix and some of the real intricate uh, inner workings of it. True. Well, the YouTube channel, like uh, I started it when, uh, when I already left the Zabbix company. Uh, and, and the main idea of the channel was, first of all, I always knew that well, there's simply not enough stuff, uh, how to and, and manuals and information about this monitoring platform uh, available in the, in the inter internet. If you would just search for the Zabbix or some tutorials, you will find something, but it's actually not enough. And quite a lot of times you will be left on your own with your problems. So you will have to search for the forums, wait when somebody will answer you, but 
you won't be able to find any any useful information in the internet so the idea was to create something like a centralized and in this case it is a youtube channel where i am trying to explain um, it would not be correct to say how to do specific things like monitor cisco something something but to explain the logic how the thing works because that's also pretty often thing that is happening let's say you found a community made template or, or some solution to monitor some custom stuff you download the template import it in the front end point it to the device and it's not working because it was made for one of the previous versions or or something else has changed so in my channel i'm trying to explain the baselines the, the logic and ideas so after watching the videos the main idea of it is so you would be able to create your templates on your own or your or your stuff and i like that a lot because that's something that's important is not just understanding and i think more technicians uh, should dive deeper like oh the tool didn't work well if you didn't understand how the tool worked it's hard to solve problems because like you said there's firmware updates so you bought you got a cisco template to monitor a cisco box but it was designed based on an older version of firmware, a new firmware changed a setting. So having an understanding uh, helps. It helped me um, because I had to solve little things like FreeNAS, there wasn't a template that I liked and the new version of FreeNAS had an error, but understanding how to monitor, how to modify a template threshold fixed the problem right away. So I was getting you know false flag alerts, um, and which any alerting system, you don't wanna ever just ignore alerts, you wanna make sure it's well tuned. <laughs> so you, you don't wanna get in the habit of ignoring it because then you'll ignore the <laughs> the major alert that comes through. <laughs> and uh, one of the other things that I also have a video in, in my channel is uh, pretty often we're talking about how to monitor the same Cisco stuff or, or some Windows servers, whatever, but we don't talk about the logic of mon monitoring itself. How should we configure the triggers? What should be the thresholds? What are the correct values or, or parameters for them? what is the value that we can get from our monitoring and because of a lot of people's people don't know these things and they just throw a lot of the templates they download everything they can get in the internet upload in the zabbix point to all of their devices in their environment then they're getting 1000 alerts each day and eventually they just start to ignore all of them and uh, after one e one year you will ask hey guys do you have a, some monitoring environment and they're like well yeah, but what's the point? We're just getting spammed with a lot of alerts. So I'm also trying to explain what should be those thresholds and, and why. So you don't want to get a false positives. And at the same time, you should not get in the false negatives. So when you receive an email, you should directly know that yes, currently there is a problem. It's not a false positive. It's not something that I could perhaps ignore. There's definitely a problem and I need to check it or, or perhaps fix it. You know, and I've covered this um, even when I talk about things like intrusion detection tools and it applies to so many different tools. There's always a little pain and you just have to start with that going, you're going to have to determine some baselines for your environment. So the thresholds you run in, a, I'll use FreeNAS as an example in Zabbix, um, the amount of jails I was running was causing it to have a process trigger. Easy enough to solve because I knew the system was working perfectly fine. So I just adjusted it to match my environment going, I run this many jails, which has this many processes. So I'm not overloading the processes. The template thinks I am, but once I tuned it, it only alerts me when there's an actual problem now and that's way better. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, also one of the most frequent questions for let's say potential users of uh, not only Zabbix but any monitoring tool is like hey what should we monitor and yeah. that that's actually a very complicated question because for me I can tell you like the basic stuff the stuff that should be monitored on any devices any computers any softwares like the CPU usage disk uh, processes uh, network traffic and stuff like that but there will always be something very specific for each company and only you know that you need to monitor that and pretty often even even the managers are not the guys who know that yes that indeed is what we need so you as a technical guy usually have to figure out on its own like quite recently i had a task uh, we had to monitor uh wi-fi devices in in the office and uh, the main problem was that sometimes the Wi-Fi box was not giving IP from 
uh, was not assigning automatically IP. And you could not know that by simply checking uh, network speed or, or something like that. So we ended up just writing a small PowerShell script that basically was performing a connect to the Wi-Fi hotspot, then checking does it has a proper IP reporting like success or false, then disconnecting, releasing IP, and doing that like each five minutes or 10, depends. So then, yeah, you can, you can really know that it is working. And this is something that's really neat inside of Zabbix is, okay, it's easy to check port 80 to say, does my web server respond? But if that response is some type of database error, it's still responded and it still shows up, but your customers can't get to your site. And this is where I've noticed with Zabbix, you have some easy customization, like you can perform some type of sanity check and say, I pull this data, verify that this data equals what I expect it to equal, like landed on a specific page, and Zabbix can then monitor from that. That way we know it's serving up the page properly, not just responding on port 443 or port 80. Yeah, from the, the functionality that is available from the box, except the simple port check, you can also perform a HTTP, a HTTP code and also the strings on the page. Yes. You can perform more complex scenarios. So in a simple example with the forum, you first of all can check a landing page. Is, does the string exist? HTTP code is 200, okay. Let's perform a login with the credentials and the passwords. Check again some of this information. Let's try to post something. Check, was the post successful? And then you can see a lot of graphs like uh, the response time, the speed, and yeah, evaluate the performance of your web page. And aside of that, this was available from the box, but Again, uh, example from the experience, the, the company that is providing the web page and the web page is uh, running a movies like uh, Netflix or, or something like that. Uh, you can get a page with a HTTP code 200 and, and there will be some string, but how can you know that the video is actually playing? Maybe there's just a black screen. And what they did in that case, just wrote a custom script that basically was taking screenshots of the video area and if it was always black for like five or 10 seconds, then obviously there's something wrong. That's neat. The only thing, yeah, they had an issues with some, some videos or movies with a long, dark intros. <laughs> Positives, but still that's like a lot better than nothing. Yeah, and this is where it gets interesting because like you said, um, it, and when you set this up on a schedule, like every, let's say every uh, 10 minutes, we check the performance of a web server, we measure those response times, then you create a trigger in Zabbix to say when a response time exceeds this threshold, but on the same side, it's logging all this. So if you want to see the historic performance, you can then start using that data, aggregate it together, and Zabbix has really slick graphs you can create. And those graphs then tell a story of, okay, this is when it gets close to the threshold during these hours, so maybe I need to do something different or this is when we have the most users on it. it it's kind of cool because it, it's collecting all the historic data, which helps you make decisions going forward. That's, an, I think, another important aspect of Zabbix is once you have all these, everyone likes charts, but we, we got to talk about the action created for them. So once you have this, this is one of the things I look at. Okay, when is my servers getting the most load? Do I need to think about adding more memory? Because I run forum servers, and as the forums have gotten busier, it's one of the things I have Zabbix actually monitoring. It's, it's great. I can just snapshot my forums and go, okay, CPU use is getting high easy enough to modify the VM and add one more CPU to it. Exactly, and uh, also vice versa. So first of all, the, the storage of history, uh, I usually divide all the monitoring part, uh, the monitoring stuff in like three parts. First of all, we're monitoring the data. Then we have triggers, which are analyzing our incoming data and notifying about the problems or trying to fix them with the pre-configured remote commands. And then there's the last part, getting used of the data that we collected. And the user is in charge to figure out for how long he wants to keep the data. He may keep it for like two weeks if he has limited, uh, limited space available on the server or for two years. If he wants to keep an insight about the data, he may choose to keep a history for two months and keep the trends for five years. It will save a lot of the disk space, but it will still keep an insight about the data. And trend basically is minimal, maximal, and average value from one item in one hour period. Then how we can how we can use the data? You told about like looking on your servers, like yeah, there's the CPU spiking, so I should add some CPU power. But the vice versa is, let's say you have one year of the data for 
or performance of your servers and how that usually happens when you deploy a new servers. You don't really know how much CPU power or memory you need, so you just basically figure out something and add plus 20%. Let's say after one year you see that, hey, I can actually take those 20% away and I will save some money from nothing because, well, my server, it's not utilizing even 30, 40% of what I, what I throw on it. You know, I've seen this a lot with people who they audit, they, you know, the previous IT people have given like a uh, full blanket, like put it all in the cloud. But like you said, you run into it, you go, wait a minute, you're paying for all the CPU time, but you're not really using it. So it can be a cost saving measure. Another thing you touched on that I think is really important is I like the fact that you can have actions more than notifications you can script actions because the ultimate and a real if you're really good at devops and you're really doing your job right you create a self-healing infrastructure and some zavix can help orchestrate that because you can say all right these are the triggers and that's not just notifying me you can like you said kick off a script to help remediate a problem and i think that's something kind of an interesting uh, aspect i know that some of the functionality of zavix can help remediate the issues is that correct that's true, but uh, the functionality is there, but I always suggest to be careful with it. Yeah. Be careful when you think on what events, what alerts, you should use those automated commands. The perfect example where you should do that is a Windows service. You are monitoring all of the Windows services, and uh, there's a lot of them. You don't create them manually. There's a low-level discovery running that is automatically discovering all the services, creating an items and triggers. Then let's say Zabbix notices that the service is stopped. Do you really need to send an email or, or mobile text message to your admin or instead you should immediately try to start the service? Just use the pre-configured remote command to start the service, then continue the monitoring. If that didn't help and service is still stopped, only then escalate the problem to your yeah. administrator or create a ticket. But this is the case when you can do that. But let's say a free disk space. Also one of the most frequent alerts and, and events that is happening. Free disk space on drive C is less than, I don't know, 5% or, or right. some other. We can send an alert, we can notify our admin, or we can run a remote command to delete some kind of the folders. It will work, it will delete it, but Think about what will happen if somebody, some users will place something important in the <laughs> So do you want to delete it automatically or do you want some human to, well, basically check it and just verify that, yeah, it's safe to delete this stuff? Yeah. There, there's, like you said, there's really good examples of when you should and shouldn't. And there's also, you should never turn any of that type of automation on until you've cleared out any false alerts because you don't want false alerts causing triggers to take action and just breaking more things. You're actually going to create a disaster for yourself doing it that way. <laughs> sure. Um, there's also a lot of testing you can do and I've reminded people about this because they're like, well, how do I know it's working? Um, there's other tools you can do and I've done this to trigger Zabbix like after I set up the monitoring. Uh, there's, it's a called stress and most of our infrastructure is Linux. So I just run the stress tool which pins the CPU which then tells Zabbix to go, hey, I see the CPU pinned over here. And so there's also some you know, testing you can do to help mitigate this. You can simulate some of the problems and that's also probably an important part of your testing procedures. How do you simulate problems? Definitely simulate them. Uh, you know, fill up, put a giant file on the C drive, see how Zabbix handles it, see how those notices are. So it's all part of the testing process before you ever get to the uh, automation process of fixing the problem. You can definitely simulate the problem and also important that you can simulate and check all the checks that you're adding to the Zabbix because for, for the people that are just beginning with the Zabbix and monitoring software, of course, they will make mistakes. They yeah. might create an item and let's say that item should check the, the, the value, the, the host, two times a day. I've set up an item, now I will wait for six hours, and then it will become not supported because I made a mistake. So I change something, and then I again have to wait for six hours. Hmm. Instead, it's pretty important to understand that Zabbix basically utilizes most of the utilities that are available on the Linux machine, on the servers. If we're talking about a SNMP stuff, well, it's just a SNMP get. Yeah. If we're talking about a Zabbix agent, you don't have to 
play with an items inside the front end. You can use a small utility called a Zabbix get that will perform the check from the agent manually. Uh, what else? Uh, database monitoring, and I'm talking not about the database as an engine, but a database data monitoring. That's just iSQL, that's ODBC, and you can run it from the CLI on your Linux machine. Get the proper, proper parameters, verify that everything works, and just then add an item inside a Zabbix. Yeah. It's, it's really nice. I really, I'll touch on a Zabbix agent. The agents are really nice and I like the cross compatibility because um, if you have a system that has an older version of Zabbix, even though I'm running the latest, uh, which is for the four series right here, 2019, um, if the client, because of what was built into them, has an older version of Zabbix client, it seems to work perfectly fine and Zabbix seems to be good about supporting the older versions of the tools as well. Well, the lifecycle policy is uh, pretty simple. The last long-term support version was 3.0. Then we had 3.2, 3.4, which has, from my opinion, quite a lot of super great functionality and one of the best, again, from my opinion, is uh, pre-processing of the values. It really saves a lot of time. Uh, now the latest version, LTS, long-term support, is 4.0. And basically, those previous 3.2, stopped the support when 3.4 was released. 3.4 stopped the support when 4.0 was released. Right. But since we talked about the agents, those are backwards compatible. Yes. The only change that happened in the release of 4.0 was the change in the header of the communication from the components. And right now, let's say before, it was a common thing. Let's say you have a server of... Uh, 3.0 something, and you could install 3.4 agents because there was just latest release of development, so probably more stable. Probably some bugs were fixed, and that was okay. Right now, since 4.0, when the header has changed and it is mandatory now, so if you have 3.0 server and you will install an agent of 4.0, the passive checks will not work, only the active. Right. Um, yeah, it's always better to keep it up to date, but I like that there's that compatibility in there. Um, the other thing I'll touch on too is I, I really like, and I don't know what other projects have done this, but because I use PFSense, I noticed it, and they have the latest agents in there. Uh, PFSense will act as both a Zabbix, uh, has the Zabbix agent as a plugin, and it has a, uh, can act as a Zabbix proxy uh, for connections. And that's actually built right into their plugin system, which I thought was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they actually support both versions. They have the three series and the four series. So you can load the latest, but if there's some use case you have for the three series, uh, they're available through their plugins as well. It makes monitoring PFSense way easy because it already has all the stuff just set up inside of it to uh, talk to Zavix. You just turn the plugin on, drop the settings in, and away you go. That's, well, I guess that's the good thing from the open source products. Not the Zabbix, not that any users are trying to make some, some money on this stuff. Yeah. A lot of community members are creating a lot of stuff, complicated stuff, the scripts, templates, and just publishing it. So take it, use it. Yeah, that's a neat feature. So there's an, and for those of you that don't know, there's an entire sharing hub of people sharing all these free templates that Zabbix has. So there's like basically like a marketplace, so to speak, where you can download all these different free templates that people created for all kinds of different scenarios. Um, I think there's things in there for like free PBX and Asterix monitoring for phone systems. There's just like so many of them. They're all categorized and organized of, uh, on there. So I think that's a great feature. Yeah, there's, well, the web page is share.zavix.com. Yep. And uh, it's called Marketplace, kind of, but it's free. Yeah, it's free. It, yeah, Marketplace is, it, it implies there's a cost, so there's not. It's uh, open source. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to, it's kind of, it's uh, in, in, in the gist of open source, you can essentially take someone's template, fork it, and make it your own on there, and then republish like your version of it too. As I noticed, there's sometimes competing versions, uh, which is kind of cool because someone monitors it this way with these triggers, and other people may monitor it this way with these triggers. So there's a, there's a lot of great information. It was a good, it was a lot of insight uh, looking at that and learning from it. Yeah, but at the same time, we talked about as before, be careful when you are using community-made templates. Yeah. That's an open source product. That's a community-made stuff. And yeah. this company doesn't take any responsibility about it. And uh, we cannot assure you that it will work because, well, it was made by somebody we don't know who. And uh, 
just read. Uh, when you go to share.zabbix.com, let's say you found a template for some device you are looking for, there will always also be information about supported versions of the Zabbix. And yes. if the template was designed by somebody for version 2.4 and you will try to import it in 4.0, well, most likely it will not work. Right. And the nice thing is the templates themselves, I mean, this is all open source. They're just a series of the, like the, the trigger codes. And so if you get a little, even the most basic understanding, you can follow through these and go, oh, okay, this is what it's doing. These are the thresholds. These are the things that was set. So it's all open source. You're not downloading any type of weird binary blob. That's the nice thing about how these templates work. They're very, I found them pretty easy to read. You can look through them and go, okay, I understand. You can walk through it and understand what it's doing and what it's asking of the servers. The template is basically just an XML file. And, yeah. and if you let it, you will find uh, simply parameters of these addicts, like the yep. item key, description, name, and stuff like that. And yeah, so they're easy enough the, to follow through. Yeah, on the side of the share.zabbix.com, there's like really, really a lot of sub in the GitHub. You can find a lot of integrations, not only like the monitoring templates, but also integrations with the ticketing systems, one-way integration, two-way integration, uh, with the cloud environments, Raspberry stuff, a lot of different things. And uh, I don't remember, it was, I think you should search for the monitoring artist and the GitHub. The guy made like a, a global search of Zabbix stuff. Wow. <laughs> There's one search field and you enter your keyword and it searches across all the GitHub, I believe, or even some, some other stuff. If I can find that, I'll leave that in the description below. So maybe if you can find that, uh, we'll leave it in the description of the video here. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. Um, so I'm going to leave links to your channel because if you want more in-depth, uh, way more than I, I covered, I have my basic getting started with Zabbix from my use case, but uh, Dimitri's way more of an expert on it and uh, his videos can help you really get a better understanding and set some of this stuff up and uh, you know get a better, uh, more well-rounded Zabbix education. There's a lot to learn, but I, I find it very worth it. I'm an, I've been watching some of the videos too, so I'll be, uh, I'll be bringing them up and I'm going to tweet out some of them as well. <laughs> I'm trying, yeah, and uh, well, the main idea is to not only make like really technical stuff. I'm trying, just as I said, talk about the idea of what would be correct, what would be wrong, and what's the possible benefits of doing that. Yeah. So, well, basically, I'm just trying to post the videos. In most cases, two times a week. That's what I'm capable of currently, and uh, yeah, I'll just talk about about the monitoring stuff. Yeah. No, I. You know, I can really appreciate that. It's one of those, um, I started doing these firewall videos and things. That's how I even got my start on YouTube is covering way more in depth rather than these more basic product reviews. And I think there's obviously proven to be a big market for that. So it's, uh, it's exciting, you know, and especially because it's near and dear to my heart because it's open source. So I like teaching people a lot of this stuff. And because like you said, you can just grab this tool. Uh, you can grab Zabbix for free. You can download it. You have all the source code. Um, their installers are great. They even have pre-compiled live CDs where you can just test without knowing much at all to get started with it. So um, I'll leave links to, of course, Zabbix and any of the marketplaces and links to uh, Dimitri's channel here. Uh, if you have questions, or whatever we'll continue this discussion over on the forums i'll leave a link to our forums as well uh, any any other any other thoughts here dimitri well uh, well just about the links yeah about uh zabbix.com page just recently there was well not that recently anymore like more than a half a year ago <laughs> uh, the new web page was added a new design and uh, aside from the documentation which well, in my opinion, that's one of the greatest documentation that I've ever seen. Uh, you can indeed find everything and you can just copy paste most of the stuff inside your CLI and it will work. But in the new web page, when you click the download button, if you figure out that you want to try uh, Zabbix on your virtual machine, there will be indeed step by step what you need to copy, how to install the repo, how to install the packages, deploy a database, create a database, import schema and stuff, all of those things. It basically takes like 15, 20 minutes to deploy a Zabbix from the scratch on your VM. So should I follow the instructions on both uh, how to set up Zabbix from the page. It is great. Just like you said, you can just copy paste it and it works. Uh, also the encryption between it, um, their documentation on how to set up the encryption between the agents was spot on. The documentation is, like you said, very extensive. Um, you can spend a lot of time reading the manual, but it's it's well documented and well organized. So definitely tons yeah. of information plus some videos uh, to better explain even some of the aspects of it. So uh, this will help you get started with Zabbix. 
Sure. All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.